John chapter 21, verses 1 through 25, so all of it. We don't want to miss anything out. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, We will go with you. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and called the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, Come, have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? <clears throat> and he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And this he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. He was the one who had reclined next to Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. So the rumor spread in the community that the disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say that to him, and he would not, that he would not die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them, and we know that his testimony is true. But there are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Let us pray. Eternal God, in the reading of the scripture, may your word be heard. In the meditations of our hearts, may your word be known. 
and in the faithfulness of our lives. May your word be shown. We pray this in your name. Amen. I maybe should have edited our main title of this sermon series from Growing with Peter, and now that we're after Resurrection and after Easter Sunday, to Still Growing with Peter, right? Thankfully for us, the story of Peter continues after Easter Sunday. All the love and the patience and the discipleship that Jesus had poured into Peter and the rest of the disciples has not been fruitless. Next week, we're going to move into the book of Acts and, and see how that, their leadership blooms until within that, the very beginnings of the early church. But first, we thankfully get our passage today of Peter and Jesus sharing a meal on the beach. So I know I have a lot of favorite Bible verses Um, And I love them for all different reasons, but John 21 has been one of my favorite stories for quite some time. And I love how it's told. And you can kind of just see it in your mind as you read it out, right? You can see them in the boat fishing. You can see them on the beach around a fire. Maybe some of us have even experienced being on a beach around a campfire, right? And, it, and so you can see this uh, moment. It's just so powerful between Jesus and Peter. So we know where we're, just so we know where we're at from last Sunday, the disciples have left Jerusalem. They've gone back to Galilee. And most of them have seen Jesus three times. Some of them only two Um, because Thomas wasn't there during one of them, but but most of them have seen Jesus three times. And they've received the Holy Spirit, and, and they have some idea that their role as Jesus' disciples is not over yet, that there's something more to go on. And Jesus has told them that he's gonna send them out into the world uh, for the same purpose that God had sent him into the world right? To love, to reconcile, to forgive. My favorite description of this purpose uh, that I have read is to be divine translations of God's love. That Jesus was a divine translation of God's love, and now Jesus is saying, you are going to be that translation of God's love, right? Basically, um, a Google Translate for the world, right? That's what we have been called to be as Christ followers, Google Translators. But it seems like in John 21, maybe the disciples were stuck on what's the next step. We're not quite sure what to do here. Okay, Jesus, our mission isn't done yet. You've called us to something more. But what does that look like? What is the plan? We don't know what to do. And so maybe unsure then of what to do next, the disciples, they head back to Galilee. And they seem to go back to what they knew. Many of them were fishermen as their occupation before they met Jesus. And so it just seems reasonable for them to go back to their job. However, as we read from this story, it doesn't go well for them, and it's not what Jesus was calling them to do. So Peter, six others, go out to fish, and they fish all night, and they catch nothing. And by the morning, I imagine they're tired, and they're ready to be done and maybe take a nap. And as they plan to wrap up this failed endeavor, a man on the shore yells to them to cast their nets on the other side of the boat. And again, this always seems like a ridiculous suggestion. It's a huge net. If fish weren't on one side of the boat, why would they ever be on the other side, right? It it always seems uh, impressive when I hear these stories that they listen and they did it. Although I wonder how much eye rolling was actually going on. I mean, let's be real, they're, they're humans just like us too. Of like, oh sure, we'll do it. But sure enough, once they listened, they caught a miraculous abundance of fish. So much so that it was amazing that the nets didn't even tear because there were so many. And at this point, it's, it says that John recognizes and realizes that the stranger on the shore had to be Jesus, right? This couldn't happen unless Jesus had a hand in it. 
It didn't make sense. This was another miracle, a crazy miracle. But my guess is that it wasn't just John that noticed. They probably all realized in that moment. John's the author, so he gets to tell the story, right? But I'm sure they all realized. In fact, for many of them, this isn't the first time something like this has happened. When we began this series on growing with Peter, one of the very first interactions between Peter and Jesus is when Jesus uses Peter's boat to teach the crowd that had gathered on the shoreline, right? And so Peter and Andrew and James and John, they were coming back from a night of fruitless fishing just, just roughly maybe three years ago. And so Jesus told them to go back out and to cast again. And even though they hadn't caught anything, and even though they knew the likelihood of getting any fish was zero, um, it was a miraculous catch again. They caught so many. I love the difference in Peter's behavior between those two stories. From the first time it happened, we were talking about that Peter falls on his knees and asks Jesus to go away from him because Peter realizes he's a sinner. That catch, in, in that moment, Peter realizes that something is going on. Jesus is someone who is amazing. And that outlandish, amazing, awesome miracle reminded Peter that he was a sinner. And so he asked Jesus to go away from him. Jesus was too good in Peter's eyes. Peter was too much of a sinner. But this time, when Peter, this happens, Peter grabs his cloak and jumps overboard to get to Jesus as fast as he can. I do love that about Peter, right? That he's kind of always the impulsive one. He seems to be the one that always wears his emotions on his sleeves, right? You, you very rarely have to guess what's going on with Peter. And as Peter and the rest of the disciples then finally bring this huge load of fish to shore, Jesus invites the disciples down for a breakfast with him. He already had, you know, fish and bread for himself, and he asked them to bring their own fish to, to cook a breakfast for them. I imagine it was exciting to see Jesus again. I love the image of this intimate, very early morning breakfast on the beach. The sun's coming up. Maybe there's a gorgeous sunrise. And John tells us there's a, a charcoal fire that's going on the beach that they're cooking the fish on. And it, we might just breeze by that reading without really pausing. But if we pause... And if we go back in our memory, we would run across a very recent moment when there was another charcoal fire with a very different group of people around it. When Peter follows Jesus, after Jesus is arrested into the, the high priest's outer courtyard, it is around a charcoal fire that he warms himself and then ultimately denies being a follower of Jesus. And we know from science and we know from our very own experiences that our sense of smell is very much directly connected to our brain and our memories and our emotions. That's why if you smell something, you can immediately be taken back to a different time and place, right? You smell something and you remember something from your childhood. Um, maybe you smell apple pie and it reminds you of your grandma because apple pie reminds me of my grandma bee. Or your parents have a distinct smell to them as children, right? My mom's perfume, my dad's deodorant. If I ever smell it, it immediately gives me the image of them. Rain reminds us sometimes that smell of spring, and it reminds us, you know, brings us right back to that moment. I don't doubt that the smell of charcoal reminded Peter of the last time he was in front of a charcoal fire. In fact, I think it was supposed to, given the conversation that happens right after. The story begins to take an 
intimate turn, right? It's an intimate scene between Peter and Jesus. The memory, the emotions, and now the meal in it turns to Peter, and, and he asks Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter had made a big deal that he would never abandon Jesus. In fact, he had just told Jesus not that long ago that he would lay down his life for Jesus. But then Peter denied even knowing Jesus. And now Jesus finds Peter in Galilee, returning to his old occupation. And so it's the moment of truth for Peter. We joke about people sometimes needing to have their come to Jesus moments, right? When they come have to come face to face with the decision and, and the truth and, and make a decision. And this is quite literally for Peter, his come to Jesus moment. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than everything that you've understood you and your life to be? Do you love me more than your occupation? Do you love me more than the roles that you play as son or husband or friend or coworker? Do you love me more than your life's expectations or your dreams? Do you love me more than hanging out with your friends? Do you love me more than March Madness? Do you love me more than you love these other disciples? Do you love me more than who you are? And are you ready to leave it all behind for me? These means everything, everything that is not Jesus. Do you love me more than these? I keep on going back to that very first story that we had heard about between Jesus and Peter, the first miraculous catch of fish, when Peter's on his knees and telling Jesus to go away from him because he's a sinner. And Jesus' answer was basically, I know that, Peter. I know you're a sinner. I know who you are. I'm not afraid of that. And neither should you be. But come. Come because I'm going to teach you how to fish for people. That was the first calling on Peter's life from Jesus. And it comes now back to this question again. Jesus is asking, do you love me? Are you willing to take up my calling on your life, Peter? Are you ready to fish for people? like me. Are you ready to do what I have taught you to do, Peter? This back and forth between Jesus and Peter can be read as convicting, right? Three times Peter denied Jesus. And in our passage today, three times Jesus asked Peter if he loves him. We know Peter well enough in, you know, with that connection, and it, we know that he was well aware that Jesus was asking him three times on purpose, right? Because it says that Peter was hurt after Jesus asked him a third time. It was convicting. And though it was convicting to have Jesus in front of you asking if you mean what you say, it wasn't the ultimate goal to guilt Peter, to shame him. The goal was actually one of great beauty, right? because there was healing in that conversation between Jesus and Peter. With each ask and with each of Peter's answers, Jesus is removing and wiping away Peter's denials. As far as the east is from the west is as far as he removes our transgressions, it says, right? With each, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, Peter is being regathered restored, reconciled, and forgiven, and then called to fulfill his mission for Jesus. There's not only an abundance of fish in this story, there's an abundance of good news. In this time of remembering his utter failure, a new memory of being forgiven is being made. This new memory memory proclaims the good news that there's forgiveness and new life in Jesus, that when we love Jesus with all of ourselves, there is grace upon grace that is showered upon us. 
And as big and as important as this story is for Peter and for us to know that even in our worst moments, worst decisions of our lives, when we've denied God, when we've sinned and hurt God or hurt others, when we've turned away, that there's forgiveness of sins and reconciliation that is even there for those that have denied Jesus, right? That have returned to Jesus after that. It's important and it's vital, as that is, to know that the story doesn't stop there for Peter, though. Peter was not just forgiven and that's it. No, Peter was forgiven and then given a purpose. Jesus was giving Peter the job of a lifetime. Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. Peter was being recommissioned and sent out with the rest of the disciples to lead them in caring for, in nurturing the followers of Jesus. Peter was now to help lead the building up of Christ's church, to take up the role that Jesus had taught him and called him to. So in the same way that Jesus was sent, Jesus is now sending Peter and the rest of his disciples to preach the good news, to have compassion on the lost, to care for believers who are struggling, to be the body, to be the church. And this is the awe of grace and forgiveness and the unbelievable love of God. The God that takes one who denies him, runs away in shame, and then God offers forgiveness and now asks him to have a leadership position to the greatest movement of good news that the world has ever known. It was going to be risky, and eventually it would cost Peter his life, but Jesus still called to Peter and said, follow me. The good news is too important, too transformational, too full of hope and mercy, too full of life to remain silent. It's like that song that we all learned when we were kids, like this little light of mine, right? This little light of mine, and and it says, hide it under a bushel. No, right? I'm going to let it shine. In Jesus, Peter is called, in, in Jesus calling Peter to follow him, Jesus told Peter to let his light shine, to let the love and the life of Jesus Christ burst forth through him. As this scene comes to a close, we have Peter probably being a little overwhelmed by all the news, and especially, it probably is overwhelming to hear how you're going to die. But Peter then does a very human thing. He happens to see another disciple nearby, and he asks Jesus, okay, but what about him, right? What about him? Will he be dying too for you, right? Is he called to the same thing? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what's that to you? You follow me. One of my all-time favorite books series is the Chronicles of Narnia, and this scene is depicted in the third book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And I distinctly remember my dad reading the series to me as I was a young kid, and we each had our favorite books. His was The Last Battle. Mine is probably The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But The Dawn Treader is probably number two for favorite because of the end of the book, because it's patterned after John 21. So you have Edmund and Lucy, the the two younger Pembency's children, and they return to Narnia with their younger cousin Eustace, and they have plenty of adventures and help, you know, find the lost lords of Narnia throughout the book. But at the very end of the book, the children are walking along the edge of the Narnian world, and there's a huge wall of water that's separating them between Narnia and the kingdom, Aslan's kingdom. And, and they come to a lamb, a little baby lamb, that is cooking like fish over a fire. And the lamb invites them to sit down and eat. And the lamb then transforms into Aslan, right? The great lion. What C.S. Lewis uses to depict 
Christ. And as Aslan is <clears throat> preparing to send the kids back to their own world now, he goes to Lucy and Edmund, and he tells them that their time in Narnia is over, that they're not going to be able to come back. They're getting too old, and that it's time for them to learn who he is in their own world, to know him by his name in their own world. And <clears throat> distraught by this idea, Lucy turns to Aslan and says, and is Eustace never to come back here either? My cousin, is, is Eustace, does he not get to come back? And Aslan replies to Lucy, child, do you really need to know that? Do you really need to know that? Child, do you really need to know that? Is Lewis's take on Jesus' response to Peter. Nowadays, we might paraphrase it and tell Peter that it's none of his business or it's none of his concern what God had in store for another person. But no matter the phrasing, the meaning is the same. Peter, you follow me, right? Don't worry about what others are doing or what they're not doing or don't compare yourself to them. Stay focused. Concern yourself with what I've asked you to do. You follow me. So many times we can get distracted by what everybody else is doing, right? What other, peop uh, what other believers are doing, what they're not doing, what other churches are doing, what they're not doing. Or, and, and Jesus' answer to us is the same answer that he gave to Peter. Follow me. You follow me. Don't worry about what others are doing. I've gifted you and called you to follow me, just as I'm leading you. So focus on me and follow along. And Peter then had that choice that day, to follow Jesus, to live into his calling, or to walk away, to stay a fisherman, to experience life abundantly and lay down his life for Jesus, or to keep his life, to play it safe, but ultimately miss out on new life with God. I make this distinction at every funeral that I have ever presided over, this reality that we have a choice, just like Peter. Scripture the, tells the big story, the great story of God's love for humanity. But also, Part of scripture is the reality that we have a choice within that story to choose life or, or to choose death right as scripture talks about it choose life or choose death we have a choice too and as peter has his come to jesus moment in the story we too are with jesus on that beach hearing jesus ask us do you love me do you love me more than these do we love Jesus more than who we are? Every identity marker that we claim, everything that we would take pride in or want for our lives, do we love Jesus more than that, more than these things? And are we willing to take the risk and give Jesus all of our life? Jesus is calling us too. And he's calling us for the same purpose that he called the disciples for, to be sent out into the world as God's divine Google translators, to love God's people all over the world, from our homes to our communities to our schools to our supermarkets to across the globe, to share the good news, to preach forgiveness, and to live a new life in the abundance and grace of God. So this morning and every morning, may we have the courage, like Peter, to step out in faith, forgiven from all the times that we have failed, and say, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Yes, Lord, I'm yours. Amen.